Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Brian Scassolati. I'm from Yale University. And I want to talk to you today about a very unique system design that uses both a robot and a virtual human to teach language skills to six to 12 month old deaf infants. So language for an infant is like food. Uh, it is absolutely essential and they consume it at a rate that is startling to everyone else. Um, we think that there's an importance to being able to provide language input to all individuals and two to three out of every thousand children are born with some significant hearing loss. Now out of those, uh, of uh, about 90% will be born to parents who have no hearing deficit. And for those children in particular, we have a very unique problem in that even when the parents are extremely well-intentioned and are trying to learn visual languages as quickly as they can, they can't keep up with the demands of the infant. The infant will always learn faster. We just don't do this well as an adult. Now, there are many technology-based interventions, uh, including things like cochlear implants, um, but those technologies are both controversial in some communities, and they're only available usually after 18 to 24 months. And that means that we have, for many children, this gap of a year and a half or two years in which they're not receiving sufficient language input. For these children, there's a risk of cognitive, social, and linguistic deficits. So our goal was to try to find a technology-based solution or intervention that we could use with this very unique population. Um, now, I'm a robotics person, so my first thought was to say, uh, let's put a robot with one of these children. And that, in some ways, is a very attractive idea because we know that robots uh, are able to cue social behavior from, in from infants. Andy Meltzoff has shown that infants as young as four to six months will do things like they will follow the gaze of a robot, they will engage the robot with conversational overtures, they will respond socially to the robot's overtures. So there are some parts of that that look like a good solution to us. Unfortunately, robots by themselves aren't capable of generating the dexterity, the manual dexterity, and the physical expressiveness in order to convey visual language. Uh, the robots that we have that are dexterous enough to sign uh, often lack the postural or facial expression to really be able to sign. And beyond that, those that do have either of those capabilities are almost universally not safe for infants to be around. We also thought about using some type of virtual technology, um, using an avatar or a virtual human on a screen. Now that has the advantage of having the dexterity and the expressiveness. They're not completely human-like, but they do have enough to convey some very basic language. However, thanks to Patricia Cool and her colleagues, we know that infants under the age of two don't really learn anything from something that's on a screen. Even really well-designed children's programs are ineffective for kids under two. They will stare at the screen, they will attend to the screen, but they don't actually learn anything from that stuff on the screen. So our thought was to try to take these two technologies and try to put them together and to use the best parts of each where the robot will hopefully be able to capture and direct the infant's attention. And the avatar, the virtual human, will be able to provide the linguistic information and stimulus. Beyond that, we hope that these two agents will be able to interact not only with the infant, but with each other, with each other and to be able to provide the kinds of social cueing and exemplars that we know are necessary for language learning. Our team consisted of four different PIs with very different backgrounds and experience. My work is in robotics and human-robot interaction, and I've been building for the last 15 years robots that teach kids social and cognitive skills. We've taught sixth graders about math, we've taught first graders about nutrition, we've taught third graders about how to deal with bullies, and we've taught first and second graders about how to learn language. The team also included David Trom from USC 
And David's an expert in virtual humans and has designed some of the most interactive and engaging systems to date, including systems like Sim Sensei, the Holocaust Survivors uh, Memorial, and the interactive twins exhibit at the Boston Museum of Science. The third member of our team is Archangelo Merlo from Chiete, Italy. Archangelo is interested in applied physiology, and he was our person responsible for sensing and perception. Because sensing for an infant uh, and what they're interested in attending to means paying attention to things like gaze cues, but also trying novel and unique forms of information exchange, like looking at thermal imaging to try to detect attentiveness. And finally, the team was grounded with Laurent Petito at Gallaudet, whose work in cognitive neuroscience and visual language and visual learners provides us with the context for this entire program. The project itself had both scientific and engineering goals in that we were using this device as both a stimulus to be able to investigate ways in which we could look at language learning and basic properties of visual languages like the temporal patterning but also ways in which we could recognize important cues from infants, like when they are attentive or ready to learn. Today, I'm gonna to focus though on the engineering and systems design aspect of this project, in which we produced this very novel integrated system that used multiple forms of technology to try to develop a teaching tool for six to 12 month old infants. Now in this system, we used, as I said, the robot as a way of attending and directing gaze to the language input that was going to be provided by the virtual character. Sensing was from a commercial eye tracking system and a thermal camera. And we'll get to the pieces of each of this uh, system's design in a moment. Um, but I'm a roboticist, so I get to start with the robot. The robot that we used in this design uh, was a 3D printed system that we adapted from a design from Hello Robo, a robot called Maki. And we made some modifications to this robot in order to make it attentive and interesting to this particular audience. We wanted to be sure that the robot was going to be attractive to infants of this age. So we accentuated some of the infant-like characteristics of the system, larger eyes, larger head, more rapid shifts of attention. We also wanted to ensure that the system was simplified enough that it wasn't a distraction uh, when the children were supposed to be attending to the virtual human. So we removed many of the extraneous features. The robot has no nose, ears, mouth, or other uh, non-critical components. We also tried to make sure that the behaviors and gestures that the robot made were identifiable. Um, and so we added a few additional cues so that the robot, especially when its head was rotated, uh, that you'd be able to tell what direction it was looking in. And that included adding the little strip of faux fur mohawk on the top of its head. We wanted to make sure that the system was agentic and that we had continuous behavior and activity from the system, including idling behavior, but that that behavior was not so distracting so as to cause the infant to constantly attend to the robot. And finally, we had to ensure that it was safe, that there were no pinch points, nothing that the infant could get their fingers into, that it was made from child safe materials, and that it could easily be cleaned and wiped down between children. So with this modified design, we tried to combine it with the work that David had done with the virtual human. We based our virtual human design off of one of our co-authors, uh, Melissa Malzkuhn, who's a native signer. And Melissa was very gracious enough to sit for us and uh, for us to be able to build a model from her uh, using a photogrammetry cage with 25 uh, DSLR cameras um, operating and capturing at about a megapixel each. With that 3D model, uh, we were then able to parameterize it and move uh, the system through arbitrary expressions. We captured Melissa signing a set of nursery rhymes and other uh, interaction gestures uh, using a full body capture suit uh, and then applied some keyframe animation to the facial expressions 
uh, as we didn't capture every individual movement of her face. With that full system, we had real-time animation control and were able to generate on the fly different combinations of face, expression, gesture, and language. And were both realistic and, uh, and uh, faithful to the original. Primarily today, I'm gonna to concentrate on the system integration and the evaluation of this. Um, so this system we designed iteratively over three years, testing it uh, every six months with a group of infants, cohort of infants. And the system changed dramatically over that time as we learned lessons about how to design for this particular population. A total of 68 infants interacted with some version of this system. And I'll be going to be presenting three case studies to try to point out some of the uh, highlights of what we learned uh, through this integration. So in August of 2016, uh, using a system that contained both the physical robot and the virtual avatar, but with no autonomy and completely under control of a human operator, um, we had a cohort of infants, including uh, this child we'll call Albert. Albert was a 13-month-old deaf and sign-exposed infant. Albert came in and he was very excited and engaged in the robot. And we saw engagements lasting up to about a minute in length, which is quite a bit for this age group. He was able to point and direct attention to the robot. He tried to get his parents, who we had told, him, who we had told not to engage with the robot or the interaction. Uh, he tried very much to get them involved. And this initial test was enough for us to validate that children were going to be able to understand the linguistic stimuli that we were producing at the upper age range that we were considering this design for. So following that initial deployment, we started to integrate a real perception system using both commercial eye tracking and a thermal imaging system to try to detect when the infant was ready and engaged with the system. That is, we only wanted the system to generate behavior when there was activity from the infant that indicated that we were uh, in the right uh, attentive and emotional state. So with this system, uh, we then tied an interaction design um, that allowed the robot to respond based on both the arousal of the infant and the infant's area of interest and attention. Following this design, uh, we exposed another cohort of infants to this robot and avatar. And this, uh, as our second case study, is a child called Bella. So in February of 2017, using some limited autonomy, uh, Bella is an eight-month-old, sign-exposed but hearing child. And she engaged with the robot very rapidly. Um, she stayed engaged with the robot for a much, more long, uh, much longer period of time. And what was most interesting to us is that she at a couple of points in the interaction, copied the behavior of the robot. And I wanna show you an example of this. So here's Bella on the bottom. She's looking right now at the robot and the robot on the top does this dramatic gesture where it closes its eyes and ducks its head. And after a small delay, you're gonna see Bella imitate or copy that same gesture. There she goes. So she's clearly engaged in the system and is actually trying to start to take some of the behavior that's generated there and reproduce it herself. Bella was very uh, engaged with this system, but we also saw uh, from this cohort of children that there were some real failures, um, that the system failed to respond when Bella, for example, waved to it and failed to respond when she fell silent. That is, when she was quiet, the robot was quiet. So we tried again to implement a more rich behavior interaction system, and that brought us to June of 2017. And our third case study, an 11-month-old hearing but sign-exposed child named Celia. With the system in place to integrate the behaviors uh, based on uh, the perceptual cues that we had from both the eye tracking and the thermal imaging, uh, we were able to extend the behavior system to include idle behavior so the robot wouldn't be quiet when the child was quiet, but rather would continue to engage with the other agentic partner. Finally, we tried as an experiment 
uh, we continued the protocol for half of the interaction time where we asked the parent not to engage with the system and then in the second half signaled the parent and allowed them to engage. And I want to show you the difference between those two. So here's Celia during the first half of her interaction. Uh, she's very engaged. In this case, she's looking over toward the robot, uh, gesturing and also mm -hmm. signing. And she attempts a number of times to try to engage her mother in that interaction. After uh, we allowed the mother to engage again with her, uh, she was much more excited, much more engaged. We saw her begin to uh, really warm up to the system. We saw a lot of clapping, a lot of raised hands, much more signing and engagement uh, between the child, the system, and the parent. So let me wrap up by just pointing out uh, some of the things that we've learned from deploying this system. First, our results definitely support the impact of embodiment. And similar to what we've seen with older children, um, we know that physically embodied systems produce more learning gains than non-embodied systems. This is data from uh, Tony Belpame's recent uh, meta-analysis of 40 different surveys using a robot and a non-robotic system um, that show substantial both cognitive and affective outcomes um, with, a Cohen alpha, with a Cohen's D of about 0.7 or 0.6. Our results also support the benefits of incorporating parents into these cues. And we've seen this work uh, also with uh, interactions with children with autism in which we can get the first real uh, behavioral changes with children with ASD using in-home robotic tutoring that incorporates the parent into the design. And finally, we expand and reinforce the use of paired agents to provide controlled and scripted interactions. This is the same type of design that we've used when teaching third graders about how to deal with bullies when we use two robots to pair off against each other and demonstrate a bully and victim scenario. There are some substantial limitations to this. First, while we do see some behavior like this child who's replicating some of the signs that we see the virtual avatar performing, especially replicating them when they're looking and attending at the robot, this is an encouraging sign, but not really evidence yet of learning. We don't see generalization to new environments. This is a one-shot protocol, and so we can't rule out the effects of novelty. And finally, we don't have enough data yet to differentiate based on age or hearing ability. So I'll wrap up and just say thanks to both our funders and to the rest of our team. And uh, thank you all for your attention. Questions? Uh, there's a mic in front. A very big room. Ah. <laughs> yeah, Janet Page from UCLan in, in the UK. Uh, interesting work. Um, I'm just wondering where you've got the, the mother and the child both interacting with the system. I mean, we didn't get any, any volume there, so I'm wondering, have you, have you a way to understand in that interaction how much the child is mainly attending to the system or mainly attending to the mother? In other words, is the system, you know, scaffolding or... or yeah, so these are very short interactions, about three minutes with the parent. Um, so I don't think we can answer that in the long term. I, do, I will tell you that the infant is fascinated with the system, attends visually to the system the entire time, and tries to draw the parent into the interaction. We see this social referencing where the infant will draw back or, or yank on the parent's uh, clothing to try to get them uh, to, to pay attention to what's going on there. We see declarative pointing. We see them trying to indicate that system to the parent. Um, but there's a lot of richness there that we haven't been able to analyze yet. Right, and, and if there's no other, I mean, another second question was that you've got the, the, you know, the large example of the robot with the great big robot eyes, which I imagine very appealing to a small child, you know, very, very appealing. And, and, and yet the, the, the avatar is, is, you know, 
just a huge and, and I wonder if you had any thoughts on on that being you know two different ways of thinking about things yeah we wanted to make sure that the language stimuli that we were providing were as faithful as we could and so we thought about putting some type of caricature uh, person or agent in place but we wanted to make sure that they were receiving realistic language stimuli so we opted for something that was much more human um, it meant that we were able to use direct, uh, direct motion capture in order to produce those segments and that meant that we were faithful to the original language cues. That's essential for us because we're not really sure what is important in that design, although it's possible we could do it with a, with a non-human agent. Okay, uh, actually it's time, so if you can. Do you want to, can I ask one more? Or uh, no.